Say this with me. Say it like you mean it. If you mean it. If you don't mean it, don't say it. I don't want to make you lie in church. So, so if you agree with it, then say it out like you mean it. Father, Father your, word is true. your word is true. I believe your word. I believe your word. You said, you said that I'm blessed. That I'm blessed. So I thank you. So I thank you. I believe you. I believe you. I don't believe what I see. I don't believe what I see. I believe what I believe. I believe what I believe. And I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. And your word says, your word says that I'm blessed. That I'm blessed. So I'm blessed. So I'm blessed. And because I believe it, and because I believe it, and agree with you, and agree with you, I shall see it. I shall see it. So I thank you now. So I thank you now. Ahead of time. Ahead of time. That I am blessed. That I am blessed. So Father, so Father because, I'm blessed, because I'm blessed, I expect you, I expect you to, make me a blessing, to make me a blessing so that I can bless others. So I can bless others. And I thank you for it. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. Now, yeah. amen. Now, I'm going to move this over here. There we go. All for that one little bar. There we go. <laughs> so, so, now, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to uh, first, actually, and this is just a real quick first, we're going to go to Romans. Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, there is, well, a lot of stuff okay but and you know this because we've talked about it before you've heard me teach very much anyway Romans 12 1 says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies you present your bodies then say God's going to present your bodies then say he's going to take your body it says you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, H-O-L-Y holy, right? Acceptable unto God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God. You got that? A holy sacrifice. Which is your reasonable service. And what does that mean? That means God is saying, before you complain about it, He said, I'm not asking you for something unreasonable. I'm asking you for something reasonable. It is right. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Yeah. Holy. Yeah. Acceptable unto God. Yeah. Amen? Right. Okay, now. He says, and this is part of it. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. Now, notice how your life is transformed. By the renewing of the mind. This is the only verse that tells us how our life is transformed. When you see people that have been in church for 20, 30, 40 years still struggling with the same problems it is because their minds have not been renewed Amen. your mind is not renewed because you can quote scripture your mind is renewed whenever your mind causes your body to do what the bible says it should be doing yeah. right what that means is when your mind tells your body to reach out and lay hands on somebody and you do it then your mind is renewed to the truth of laying hands on people Amen. do you hear that just because you know Mark 16 it says lay hands on the sick and they'll recover just because you know that verse doesn't mean your mind is renewed unless you're actually laying hands on the sick simple as that all right it's funny in the church today and I don't want to get too far on to this in the church today you don't actually have to do what it, the Bible says you just have to know what it says and basically give it lip service and agree to it church today what we have done is we have made everything now listen carefully because there's partial truth remember if there's partial truth there's partial untruth and what we've done in the church is we have made everything in the church about motive well you say well what's wrong with that well there's nothing wrong with motive if it's right motive but when you make everything about the motive now there's something wrong with that do you get the difference there? Right. So there's truth about motive, and you've got to focus on motive, right. but you don't focus on motive to the exclusion of everything else. Come on. Amen. Because 
Jesus, it's really amazing, only the church emphasizes motive. Right. Jesus emphasized action. He said, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? You get that? He didn't, he didn't say, why do you call me Lord and, and, and don't think about it? And don't think about what I said and don't agree with what I said. He didn't say that. He said, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I said? He said, if you see your brother hungry, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. Feed him. He didn't say, well, what James says, well, the one thing we're not supposed to say is, well, brother, be warmed, be filled, and think that our words of blessing equal us doing something. You can't say, oh, man, I tell you, I really feel for those widows and orphans, and I hope they're, they're taken care of, and then you don't do anything. If that's the, what you do, you really don't feel for the orphans and widows. So you have to realize Jesus was all about action. Now, should it come from a right motive? Yes, of course. But even if it's not, some people say, well, you know, it, it, you're just laying hands on a sick because you want to be seen. Okay, uh, let's say that was true. If people are getting healed, guess what? They're still getting blessed even if I was doing it from a wrong motive. Isn't that right? Paul said, if I give my goods to the poor, I give my body to be burned, and I don't have love, it profits me nothing. It'll profit the people he gave his stuff to. Right? They're going to profit by whatever he gave them. But we have to realize, so it's not... Now, the motive has to deal with you, and God will deal with you and your motive later. But one of the ways that he can tell your motive is by what you do. Okay? Here's the thing. <clears throat> Believers shall lay hands on the sick, right? right? Believers do good works, right. right? He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, right? Yeah. Now, you say, does that person have a good motive? Well, we don't know. You don't know. Only God knows, and only that person knows. Is that right? right. Yeah. Now, think about that. So, but here's the thing. If he said that if, you're, if you believe in him, you're going to do what he did, and if you're so worried about motive that you don't do it because you're not sure, then you're not going to do what he said. So if you're not going to do what he said, we know your motive isn't right. Because now you're disobedient. And you can't be disobedient with a good motive. Does this make sense? Now, I could do a good work and help somebody, and that doesn't prove my motive is right. But if I see a person that has a need and I do nothing... That proves my motive is wrong. Right. Or if I only do it because somebody else is there, that proves my motive is wrong. Right. You see? I've gotten where I don't like to go out and with people and, and minister to people on the streets. I don't like to go. And now, I'll go to Walmart by myself. I'll go to some restaurant where I'm at. I'll pray for people. I'll do things, but I don't do it in front of people. Why? Because it got to the point where when I went with people, they didn't do anything. They just stood around and watched me do it. And then they're like, well, let's see how he does it. You know what? It doesn't matter how you do it. Right. You know, well, how do you lay hands on the sick? Uh, here's your hand. There's the sick. <laughs> there you go. Yeah? Now, I'll admit, you can do it wrong by placing your hands on the wrong places. So use some common sense. But at least do it. Amen? So all I'm trying to get at is that the church has emphasized motives to the point that people now, and here's the bad thing, people actually don't do things because they're afraid they're doing them out of the wrong motive. So they found a reason not to do it. Well, even if you've got a wrong motive, do it anyway. Help the people. Believe God. Set them free. If you did it out of a wrong motive, you just don't get credit for it. He, he's not going to smack you down. He's just not going to give you credit for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you should still do it no matter what, right? Regardless of your motive. Now, why? Because, hey, listen, I don't care what your motive is. If, you, if there's some disaster going on and we're trying to give food to people because the disaster happened, I'm not going to question your motive why you give into that fund. No, I, don't, I don't care what your motive is. You know, blow your trumpet, whatever it is, before you give your alms. I don't care what you do. Do all that stuff that Jesus said not to do. Just give into the fund. That's going to help people. Come on. Amen? Does that make sense? Come on, we got to get real with this stuff. 
we're either going to do it or we're not. Now, if you're so worried about your motive, well, let me put it this way. If you're that worried about your motive, I can tell you already it ain't right, right? <laughs> because at least part of it is selfishness, right? Because you're worried about your motive more than you are about their hunger. So there out there tells you something's wrong, right? So there comes a point that we have to go, you know what? And this is, there's a lot of times, I mean, I, I don't, maybe I can't speak for you, but there's times when I've questioned my motives, when I've said, okay, why did I do that? Right. You know, was, did, did I really do that out of, out of a pure heart? Did I, was there any selfishness in there? Was there anything, is there any reason why, other than just the love of God and love of people that I did that? And you know what? I've come to the conclusion of, God, you know what? If there was anything else in there, okay, straighten me out. Right. Tell me. Show me. Right. I'm asking you. I'm yours. Tell me. And until I hear something, I'm going to keep doing it. Now, I'm not talking about doing something wrong. I'm talking about doing something right. right. But I'm not going to sit there and, and have you know, a, a paralysis by analysis. Yeah. You know? Well, God, do you want me to heal? Here comes a person. You know, they're walking on crutches, walking on whatever. And, and God, do you want, me to, you want me to lay hands on that person? I'll do it. God, if you want me to, I'll do it. Now, <laughs> just, just tell me, and pretty soon they're gone, yeah. and you're still waiting to hear from God. Yeah. Well, guess what? Do it, and then come back to God and go, was that right or wrong? Come on. And what's God going to say? You did good, right? What's he going to say? Well, I didn't want them healed. You shouldn't have got them healed. I don't think you're going to get anybody healed that God didn't want healed. Yeah. Right? See, you really ain't got to worry about it. Now, God wants everybody healed, so right. everybody should get healed, Come right? On. But at some point, we got to quit being religious and actually start living by the law of love. What would love do? Yeah. And see, not, not, not the theological love, but the God kind of love. Right. See, the God kind of love sees a need and meets it. It's that simple. And doesn't even question the motive. Doesn't even question, well, do I have enough faith? Well, do I have enough power? Where do I? No, doesn't even think that. Just need, oh, here, can I help? Yes. And they help. Now, theological love says, oh, man, the Bible says lay hands on the sick. I'd love to do that. But, you know, they could be reaping what they sowed. So maybe this is God's way of teaching them a lesson. So I'm not going to lay hands on them because I don't want to interfere with what God is doing. See, now, that's, that's the theological kind of love because you've got to go to church to learn that. <laughs> See, you don't learn that by loving people. Yeah, you right. learn that in church. Yeah. All these doubts and unbelief and these yeah. sacred cows, you don't learn those on the street corner. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you learn those in church. Yeah. You don't learn about Paul's thorn down at the bus stop. That's right. You learn about it in Sunday school somewhere, yeah. Yeah. right? And so we are schooled into unbelief yep. many times. You know, you, you, you might be able to get drugs off the street corner and you might be able to get, you know, some sacred cow off the street corner, right? Well, you're not going to get the sacred cow off there. He might say you're drugs, but he's not going to tell you something about the Bible, right? right? You got to go to church to get that. And that's what is amazing. You got to go to church to get messed up. That's sad, right? <laughs> when you ought to be able to go to church, get straightened up, Right? So now, let's look at this. He says here, Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> so that you, can, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say that the grace, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Let's stop right there. Okay, now if you read the rest of the epistles and you read what God has said about you, you've got to think pretty highly of yourself to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Because yeah. God has said some pretty big things about you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He has said a lot of good stuff about you. He said that you are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Amen. That's a pretty big deal. That's a good blessing. Yeah. Isn't it right? Doesn't get much better than that. He said he's blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Yeah, that's pretty good. If you walk around going, I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing. Every one of them. I got them all. Every one of them. People go, well, man, don't you think highly of yourself? Nope. I think according to the Word of God. Yeah. Now, so how can you think more highly of yourself than you ought? It's simple. The minute you start thinking you're better than somebody else, yeah. the minute you think more highly of yourself than you do your neighbor, you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. So what you ought to be thinking is, bless God, you bet. What can I do? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lay hands on the sick. Yep, that's part of all things, so I can do it. And guess what? They're going to recover. 
You know why? Because through his stripes, they've been healed, and I'm just here to deliver it. And I can do that because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Isn't that right? Now, that's thinking as highly of yourself as you are. That's not thinking more highly of yourself than you are. So he says, well, you know, what, what are y'all going to do? Well, we're going to go out and lay hands on the sick, get some people healed. Well, that's awful conceited, thinking you're going to go out and get people healed. Well, well I said we. Who did you include in we? I'm including me and Jesus. Yeah. Right? I'm the hands. He's the power. Yeah. Right? And I know wherever my hands go, his power is there. Why? Because he's in me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. So I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to outrun him. not going to get ahead of him. Nope. Right? Not going to lay hands on somebody he doesn't want me to. You say, why? Are you, is he going to tell you not to? No. He's never going to tell me not to lay hands on somebody. Why? Because he's already told me to lay hands if they're sick. He's already told me to lay hands on the sick. He can't tell me to lay hands on the sick and then tell me not to lay hands on that sick person. Right. Yeah. Why? Because he's already said one thing, and he will not alter the thing that's gone out of his mouth. Right. So it's real simple. So I, I can't make a mistake. If you're sick, I lay hands on you. That's no mistake. Right? right. Yeah. And it's no mistake for me to expect me to do my part, and if I do my part, I expect him to do his part. Yeah. My part's the hands laying on and the believing. His part is the recovering part or the power to recover. And then the sick person's part, well, their part is just to recover. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. At some point, you just got to start believing God. Yeah. You got to, you know, they used to call uh, Jack Coe a man of reckless faith. Yeah. Why? Because he was reckless yeah. right? in his faith and did wild things. And, and it's amazing. At, and, and at times, see, <laughs> I, I'm a, a child, I guess, of the 60s. I was born the last year of the 50s, born in 1959. And so I was raised in the 60s on the sitcoms of the 60s and all that kind of stuff. And my mom and I would every day would sit down and we'd watch, you know, I Love Lucy or something and drink one of these little bitty Cokes. And I have to be careful how to say that because I said one time, I said, I mean, those little bitty Cokes, I said, I could snort more Coke than that. And I'm like, well, that's not what I meant, actually. I meant it was so small, okay? <laughs> and I told one person one time, I said, yeah. I said, I've only got one vice. I got a Coke habit. And they're like, really? And I'm like, different kind of Coke, different kind of Coke. <laughs> So, but we would sit down every day at a certain time and watch uh, I Love Lucy and watch some of the other things, you know, was it uh, My Three Sons and Father Knows yep. Best and all these shows and I was ready. And, and the strange thing was, I was, you know, growing up believing that was like real life, you know, and I thought that's the way things should be. And, and so when I read, and my mom taught me how to read by reading the Bible, so I was reading the Bible at the same time we were watching, watching these TV shows. And it was funny because as I'd read the Bible, I'd read these stories, and then I started reading stories about Jack Coe. You know, this was a little bit later when I was older. And I'd read about Jack Coe, and I'd read these testimonies of these amazing things that happened. I read uh, Every Increasing Faith, of Smith Wigglesworth, an apostle of faith about yeah. Smith Wigglesworth. And I'd read these stories and testimonies and their life story. And this, th it never occurred to me that this was anything but real. Yeah. And I'd read their life, and I'm like, and then I always, for some reason, there were certain scriptures that stuck with me. And one of those scriptures was that God is no respecter of persons. Yeah. So every time I'd read about Wigglesworth, I'd say, you know what? If God could use him, he can use me. Yeah. You know, he wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect. So we're in the perfect position for God to use us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if God can use him, he can use me. So I'd read these testimonies, and I was just, you know, foolish enough to believe them. Yeah. And think, wow, that's, that's good. And church is supposed to be getting better and better. Why? Because the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. So the yeah. church ought to get better and better. So whatever Wigglesworth did, we ought to be doing that ten, you know, times ten. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And it should get better and better. And we should see these things. And so I just believe God. And just, and, and, but the real key was this. When I started reading about Jack Coe, A. Allen, those guys, I thought, man, these guys were wild. And that's our problem. We've gotten too calm. Yeah. Yeah. And these guys, they call him you know, a man of reckless faith. We reckless, isn't calm. And I started realizing these guys did some things. They, they took some chances, you know. They, they would step out. And, and honestly, what it comes down to, now listen, if, if you know the ministry and what we do, we're all about results. We, we believe if it's the Bible and it's God, it's results. You get results. If you do it right, it works. Real simple. And yet, there comes a point where you have to throw caution to the wind. And you just have to say, you know what? I don't care about my reputation. I don't care what people think about it. I'm going to do this, and it's going to work or it's not going to work. And if it does, glory to God. And if it doesn't, I'll keep doing it till it does. Why? Because the Bible says it, so let's do it. 
And I just went out, started going to Walmart all by myself. Because why? Why did I go to Walmart? Because that was the marketplace. Everybody goes to Walmart. The town I was in, if you stayed there about three hours, you met everybody in town. Because <laughs> everybody came through there, you know, at some point, right? At one point, I told them, they said, you know, here's how much it costs. I said, does, does that include my rent? Because I'm here so much, you ought to charge me rent, you know? <laughs> and so the other day, I walked out of there, and it was like, I don't know, $120, something like that. I'm like, man, I'm getting out of here cheap. I don't ever get out this cheap. What's going on? And I think I was having my oil changed. And I thought, I know why y'all take so long doing it, because you know the longer I'm here, the more I'm going to spend. So you just take longer to do my oil. Next time I'm going to realize that and, you know, just sit back there in the back and not go shopping while I'm here. So, and then, of course, when I get there, everybody knows I'm there, so everybody starts calling in their order. You know, hey, while you're there, would you pick this up? And while you're there, would you pick that up? And I'm like, no, because I'm going to pay for it, and you're not going to pay me back. <laughs> Of course, that's my kids doing that, so it doesn't matter. So, you know. But now notice here, he says that a man should not think more of himself more than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, it's amazing here because it says, of course, Paul is talking to the Roman church. And he says that according as God has given uh, the measure of faith to every man. But he also says uh, later, he actually says, but er all men don't have faith. And so who is he talking to? Well, all people don't have faith. Now, that doesn't mean they can't have faith. What he's saying is everybody's not walking in faith. People, have, people that have not received Jesus, have not uh, been born again, they don't have faith in him, so they don't have faith. But the minute they decide to have faith, they've got it. So you can immediately decide to have faith, and it's yours. How do you decide to have faith? Well, you have to hear it. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. But it's not just by hearing. Actually, if you look the word hearing there, it literally means hearing that you do. So... God is very big on you doing what you hear. That's why he said in James, you know, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. He said, why? Because if you're just a hearer, not a doer, you deceive yourself. So God always wants you to be a doer of his word, not just a hearer. But you've got to hear it to become a doer. And the minute you hear it and you do it, faith is there to cause it to come to pass. That's how it works. You don't just sit and pray for faith. Isn't it funny? You ever notice that whenever Jesus... Uh, his disciples said, Lord, uh, increase our faith. Remember that? And you notice what he didn't do? He didn't say, all right, that's a good prayer request right there. Did everybody line up? And he didn't walk down the line and go, receive faith, receive faith, have faith, increase faith. He didn't do that. He turned around to him and said, if you had faith, you would say. So what? they said, we want to increase faith. He said, okay, to increase faith, you've got to have some faith. You can't increase what ain't there. Right? So to have faith, you get to increase faith, you got to have faith. And he said, if you had faith, you would say. And when you start saying because you have faith, guess what? Your faith will increase. Yeah. You get that? It's the simplest thing in the world. Now, <clears throat> here he goes on and he says, look at verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy... Now, let's, let's stop there a second. Look at that. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. You hear that? According to the grace that's given to us. So everybody doesn't have the same degree of grace. You hear that? Grace isn't just this one-size-fits-all thing. There's just there it is, and now you got grace. And so I got grace. I stick in my pocket. I walk around with it, and I got grace. Oh, have you got your grace? Because I got my grace, and you got the same. And we got the same amount of grace. No, there's different degrees of grace. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said that we should constantly be growing in grace. So if you can grow in grace, that means you don't start with all you got and all you can have. That means you can always grow more in grace. You know that growing more in grace is not so much about you, but about how you look at others. Your growth in grace is how you look at others and how whether you judge them or not or how you come against them or what you say about them. That has a whole lot to do with how much grace you're in at that time. Right? You say, why is that? Because according to the grace you give, that's how, what kind of grace you're going to get. Sowing and reaping. Isn't that simple? So, now watch this. He says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith. Now, this is some of what Tom was talking about today. He said, if, we're gonna, if your gifting is prophecy. Now, there are people who have a gift, and it, sometimes it's like they didn't even want it. It's just, you know, it was just given. It's just there, right? And it flows, and they didn't even ask for it. 
but then they find that gift and they start functioning in it and usually they get really good, but usually when that happens, that's the only gift they operate in. And that's sad because that's not what God wants. But now notice this and notice carefully. If you're going to prophesy, you prophesy according to the proportion of faith. What does that mean? That means that prophecy isn't a set thing. That means that you can prophesy according to the proportion of faith. In other words, the more you can stretch, the more accurate you can prophesy. But you have to stretch. You can't just sit and do nothing and expect it to grow. See, most people say, well, if I know what I say is going to be accurate, I'll say it to everybody. Now, you got that backwards. you got to start saying it to everybody, and it'll get more and more accurate. Why? Because you're going to grow, and you're going to get better at it, and you're going to get better at hearing, and you're going to get better at saying when you first start doing it, you're probably going to mess it up. You're, and you're probably not even going to get the, you know, you'll say, uh, sir, would you please stand up? I have a word for you. And God said, you'd already missed it. It was for the man sitting next to him. <laughs> you know, and, you, and he stands up and you start prophesying, thus saith the Lord, you're going to go across the world and you're going to preach the gospel. And the guy's like, I don't even have a passport. <laughs> I don't want to go anywhere. There is no desire. And, and the guy sitting next to him said, man, I wish I'd get in the Prosty like that. I'm ready to go. I got a passport right here in my pocket. I get, I get on a bus tonight and go down to that. It's like, just because you missed it. Well, one guy. Well, the more you do it, the more accurate you get. But see, the problem is in the church, we don't allow for growth. You got to get it perfect every time or, oh, that doesn't count. Right? Now, see, that's why he tells us we have to judge prophecy. You don't have, if it was perfect every time and just pure God, you couldn't judge it. You're going to judge God? But that's why he tells us to judge it. Why? Because this pure spirit of God coming out of you has to pass, this pure spirit has to pass through your unrenewed mind and gets tainted along the way. And from the time you receive it to the time it comes out of your mouth, you've already added something to it because you think you're going to dress it up and you think you're going to make it better. And all you do is add yourself into it and you mess it up and all of a sudden now the prophecy isn't near as accurate. Right? And God said, just say this. I was walking down the street one day with a friend of mine. He was very annoying because <laughs> he was. We were constantly battling back and forth, arguing over being led by the Spirit. And he was constantly saying, "Oh, you can't do anything unless you're led by the Spirit. Gotta be led by the Spirit. Don't do anything until you're led by the Spirit." And I, and I said, "I believe I'm always led by the Spirit." He said, "Well, it's obvious you're not." <laughs> and I said, "Well, who asked you anyway? You know." <laughs> so. But we were always going back and forth, right? And so he and I are walking down the street one day, and we're just walking. You may have heard me talk about this, but we were walking down the street, and he, we're doing nothing, just talking. And he reaches down and picks up this rock. It's just a rock. Nothing special about it. Just, and he's just kind of holding his hand. And I, I noticed he picked it up, and he's just holding it. And we walk about a block. And there's this guy walking toward us. And as he walks toward us, my friend looks at that rock and walks, steps over in front of this guy, and the guy stops, holds his hands out, and the guy's like, Holds his hand up. He drops that rock in his hand. Guy looks at it, dropped it, started crying. And he said, I prayed today, God, if you're real, have somebody walk up and hand me a rock. Oh. Amen. Wow. And then we kept on walking. And Bill, my friend, he was quiet. And I looked at him. I said, well, that was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> He just looked and smiled at me. And just, <laughs> but he knew I got it, right? And I realized, yeah, God can tell you to do specific things. But we think that's the only way God leads, and that's not how he leads. That's not the only way. He can lead that way. And that can be even a highly refined degree. But it's not always the way he leads. And how he leads is mostly by his nature, his character, and his word in you, knowing what to do and where to do. And you don't even feel like you're led. Matter of fact, you probably wonder if you're being led. And sometimes you only know you were led afterwards when you look back and go, wow, that was God. Why? Because that's how the Holy Spirit works. Remember the trees, the wind, and the leaves blowing? How do you know? You don't see it beforehand. You see it afterwards. You see the results of it. But most people don't want to step out because they're not sure that they're hearing God. Right? Now, in this, now watch this. Because he says here, and, and the more your faith grows, the more you stretch, let me put it this way, the more you stretch, let's say just with prophecy, the more you stretch, the more your faith grows in that as you get more accurate 
and pretty soon, but you have to start with the idea of, you know what, even if I'm wrong, I'm going to say this anyway. Worst case scenario, I'm wrong, right? And if I am, guess what? We'll fix it. I'll pray. God will show me where I was wrong. He'll show me how to, and but we'll fix it. He can turn it around, right? But we're so afraid of making a mistake that we do nothing. And that's the biggest mistake you can make because you're not going to help anybody if you do nothing. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, so you learn how to stretch. Now, and, and this isn't a gift seminar technically, but we have to realize that, okay, we have three uh, main vocal gifts, as they would generally call them, right? And so in that, we have the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and prophecy. Those are the primary, um, as they, they would say, vocal or inspirational gifts along those lines. And because we use the word prophecy so generically that we think it always has to do with predicting something, but it doesn't, right? Actually, according to the Bible, and I, I learned this from Dr. Summerall, who was the acknowledged uh, you know, authority on the gifts of the Spirit, because he learned it straight from Howard Carter, who was the one that actually reintroduced the gifts into the church and defined them and taught them. And so they gave, he, he gave very clear things. A word of knowledge is a word of a fact that is true right then that you have no way of knowing it other than by the Spirit of God telling you, okay? And it's a word of knowledge. It's a word of knowing. But now notice it says to each one he gives a word, a, one, one, you know, that one word. In other words, that's not all of God's knowledge. That's a specific fact that is true right then. For instance, if you said, um, okay, God, I, I can't find my keys. Where did I put my keys? I lost my keys. God, where are my keys? And all of a sudden he says, uh, look behind, you know, look on the kitchen table behind the salt shaker, right? Hmm, I, that's weird. I don't even remember having my keys at the table. And you walk in there, there they are. Okay, that's a word of knowledge, right? Now, you might not call it that because you're thinking God is just leading you. He just led you, right? Uh, to go look at this and go find it there. But it is actually a word of knowledge. Now, the word, now here's the thing. According to the Bible, the Bible says that the gift of prophecy is to comfort, right? And to exhort and to edify. Is that right? To comfort, exhort, and edify. To comfort, we all know what to comfort means, right? To comfort someone. And it says to, to uh, exhort, and, the, and it's funny because to exhort is almost the opposite of comfort because when you exhort someone, you're encouraging. You're not comforting, but you're actually encouraging. And sometimes the word of exhortation can be very direct and almost harsh. And so there's a word of exhortation, right? But that's also prophecy. Why? Because that's the gift of prophecy. Because the gift of prophecy will do, it will cause comfort and exhortation and edification, which builds you up. So... Prophecy is going to comfort, it's going to exhort you to move forward in God in some way, and it's going to cause you to be edified or built up. So prophecy is not going to tell you what a dirty dog you are, right? <laughs> prophecy is not even going to reveal your sin. It's not going to call your sin out. Why? Because it's not edifying, it's not, it doesn't exhort, and it doesn't comfort, right? So that would be a, the operation of another gift word of knowledge or something along those lines, okay? Could be several different gifts. And there's even some blendings. But now, the last one, the word of wisdom. Now, see, the word of wisdom is not God's wisdom in the sense of, like, Solomon. You know, Solomon was given wisdom, but it was not the, the gift of the word of wisdom, right? It was wisdom in general. But the word of wisdom is a specific thing, and the word of wisdom is telling a person what they should do. It's a word of God's wisdom. Somebody comes to you and says, what should I do? My life's a mess, uh, I've, or I've got this opportunity to get this job, but I also got this other job. Which job should I take? The word of wisdom would say, thus saith the Lord, if you want to use those terms that way, and say this job. Why? Because he's giving him direction. The word of wisdom is actually what we call prophecy. The word of wisdom includes what most people think of prophecy, of predicting something or foretelling something. All right? That's the word of wisdom. That's not the gift of prophecy. The gift of, now, this is why when Neighbor Tom was talking about prophesying, this is why you can prophesy. You fill yourself with the word of God. Well, guess what the word of God does? It comforts, it exhorts, and it edifies. 
So you fill yourself with the word of God, and as you stand before a person, you can actually start quoting scripture, and what you're doing is you are priming the pump, and you are prophesying to them, and you may start in the flesh, but you'll end up in the spirit. That's what Wigglesworth did. So you can start just by quoting scripture that's going to edify, comfort, uh, it's going to exhort someone to do something, and then in the middle of that, God will start saying this and this and this right in the middle of it, and you're thinking, wow, where'd that come from? And he will start giving you specifics, and when he gives you the specifics, you think, oh, look, that's prophecy. No, no, what it is, actually, at that point, now that has become a word of knowledge, right? Because it's a specific fact. Uh, you know, before on your way here tonight, you were in the car uh, with your spouse, and you said this, and she said this, or he said this, and this is what's going to, okay? That would be a word of knowledge, and it would be interjected right in the middle of the prophecy that you have been giving when you started quoting scripture and edifying. God says that you are highly blessed. God says he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heaven and places. God says that by his stripes you're healed. What am I doing? I'm prophesying. Why? Now, I'm not predicting the future unless you're sick and you need healing. And if you're sick and you need healing and I say that, I'm predicting your future. But do you see how all this works? But see, we get so hung up sometimes on the definitions that we're so afraid of it, we can't actually walk in it. But the more you stretch the better you get. You take a person like William Branham, uh, Gordon Lindsay said that in thousands of times of him operating in the gift of the word of knowledge, you never saw him miss it one time. Not any detail. He would give your license plate number. He would tell the address of the house you lived in. He would tell the, the color uh, of your, you know, what, you, what you were wearing that day or the day before. I mean, amazing details. And it was just accurate every time. And then you take uh, another person, well, I'm not gonna give a name, but I was in Tulsa and I saw a person, uh, went to one of their meetings, and they started calling out people and started giving words of prophecy, and it was very general, yeah. very general. But now notice, and, and I told my wife, because she was there, and I told her what was going on, I said, um, this person, I'm not, again, not going to mention name, but he's well-known already, but he was moving out into these things, and he wasn't real accurate, but he was starting to be accurate in areas. In other words, he would say, uh, you know, it's something over, somebody over here, and it's something to do with your lower back and I, matter of fact I think it's on the left side so you can say that's very general right and honestly you really don't need a word of knowledge okay if most of your congregation is over 40 <laughs> you really don't need a word of knowledge for that okay right. you can pretty much go yeah you could actually don't probably call people out right, right. let me see who's got gray hair yeah okay yeah you're the one I'm looking for let's get now because that's just how most people are right? right but now but I saw and I told my wife I said uh, he's stretching and he's starting to become more, used to it was very general, now it's got more specific into areas. I said, if he, if he doesn't get scared, and if he doesn't back off, yeah. if he doesn't get comfortable and go into cruise control, if he will keep stretching, it will get more and more fine-tuned and get more specific and more accurate. Wow. And he actually did that, and now he's actually known for operating that way. And so you, can, you, you, you grow in it. And as you grow in it, as you grow according to your proportion of faith. See, every time you get it, every time you hit it right, your faith grows. Yeah, true. And the next time you'll stretch further. But uh, you got to start where you are. So you start by prophesying. What is prophesying? It's what we just said. It's speaking words of edification, exhortation, or comfort. Right. So you fill yourself with the Word of God because the Word of God does those three things. And then you start speaking those three things out. And as you do that, then in the middle, God will go, look, tell them this. And you'll get a specific thing. And then that word of knowledge comes in in the middle of that prophecy. Yeah, Amen? And you start to stretch. Right? That's why he says all of you can prophesy. Right? Well, of course you can. Why? Because you got the Bible. You can start reading. You can fill yourself with the word of God. You can exhort someone. You can edify someone. You can comfort someone. Is there anybody in here that you don't think that you could comfort someone edify someone or exhort someone using the Bible. And I'm not talking about you reading it. I'm talking about what you already have in your heart, what you know right now. Is there anybody in here that doesn't have a scripture that they think would exhort somebody to do something for God? Is there anybody that, that doesn't have it? You, you can't think of a scripture. You don't have a scripture in you that you've read before. Because if you have it, then you can prophesy and you can exhort. Yeah. Amen? Now, do you know a scripture that would edify somebody, that would build them up, right? So if you have a scripture that does that, see, you can start with that, and you are prophesying at a certain level of prophecy. It's not a high level, but it's a starting level. 
and then you start and you prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And as your faith increases, the prophecy gets stronger. And you, more words will come out. And in the middle of that, he'll give you words of knowledge, words of wisdom, all the discerning of spirits, all this stuff will just start coming in there. Why? Because you're just stepping out. And believe it or not, God is looking for people that will step out. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro upon the face of earth, seeking those in whom he may show himself strong. He's just looking for somebody. Smith Wigglesworth used to say, there is something about faith in God that will cause God to bypass 10,000 people just to get to that one person that will stretch their faith out there. He said, I'll stretch my faith out as far as it'll go, and if it doesn't go far enough, God's got nine gifts of the Spirit to tack on to the end of it to get it the rest of the way. Yeah. Yeah, what was he trying to say? Get started. Just stretch. Just try. Just love people enough to do something. Amen? Yeah. You know, it's amazing. The times that I've been out praying for people in Walmart and different places, and it's other places, but that's the general. That's, uh, I probably pray for more people in Walmart than any other one place, you know. <laughs> and when I go out there, I have never, now I'm not saying every person I've ever prayed for in Walmart got healed instantly, but I will tell you this, and I've prayed for now thousands of people in Walmart, and I will tell you this, in all that time, I have never had one person ever say, how dare you think that you're going to walk up and just pray for me? I've never had that happen. You know what I've, even when I didn't see results, you know what I've had happen? They start crying and say, thank you. Thank you for caring enough to pray for me. Why? Because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the problem is they think the church doesn't care about them except for their wallet. They think that's the only thing the church cares about. And we've got to get beyond that to where they, where they realize we actually care for them. Now, here's the secret to caring for them and getting them to believe that you care for them. You've got to actually care for them. Okay? Because they can spot the fake. They, they can spot where you want to put a feather in your cap and you're keeping record of how many people you prayed for. They can spot that stuff, right? Why? Because it's not real. And they can spot, and believe me, they're used to the scams. They're used to the con artists. They can spot it. So you have to decide, I'm going to actually love people. It's maybe not as easy as it seems, right, or as it sounds. But you have to decide, why? Because you're commanded to. Well, some people are hard to love. Then God's got a lot of faith in you because he told you to do it. Amen? If he told you to do it, he'll empower you to do it. God never tells you to do something that he doesn't empower you to do. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, let's read this. Where was I? Oh, yeah, okay. He says here, <clears throat> having then gifts differing. Okay, remember, I know I've already read this. But now notice, we all have gifts differing. But, but now notice, we're all supposed to grow up into Jesus, who has had all the gifts, because he didn't operate. Now, listen carefully. Jesus technically did not operate in gifts. I know... I've heard other people say differently at different times, and, and I used to say the same thing, but Jesus did not technically operate in gifts. You never really see him saying, thus saith the Lord, and yet you see him prophesying. You can see things he said. When he said, he that believeth on me, the work that I do shall he do also. He was prophesying. Right? When he said, believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. He was prophesying. Why? Because that was something that well, had not, is, was not happening yet at that point. Some have been doing it, but he was prophesying a future generation, right? But yet he didn't say, thus saith the Lord. Why? Because he operated in the fullness of the Spirit, not in gifts. Gifts are burst of power. The fullness of the Spirit is all the time, right? It's the difference between jumping in a mud puddle or swimming in a swimming pool, right? You can jump in a mud puddle and make a big splash. That's usually how gifts work. But when you swim in the swimming pool, now it's all around you and it's all the time and it's not it doesn't, usually if you're going to operate by gifts many times the problem with that is that we end up drawing attention to ourselves, right you power, oh that person, oh they work with the word of knowledge, oh that person, oh they're big in the gift of healing, oh that person and see all of a sudden it's about that gift and that gift is about that person right. instead of well, God uses that person to heal people God uses that person to speak to people. Or just God speaks to people. God heals people. See, and the attention gets on the person. Now, notice here. So we all have gifts differing, and we're not to envy each other's gifts, but to know that, okay, if, you have a, if, if I have one gift, you have another gift. I should function in my gift as strong as I can. You should function in your gift. And if I'm smart and you're smart, we're going to get together and go, how do you do that? 
and I'm going to learn from you, and I'm going to start functioning in your gift, and you're going to learn from me and start functioning in my gift, and now we've both grown stronger, and if one of us gets stronger, we're all stronger. Yeah. Amen? Absolutely. We don't look at it and go, well, I'm not going to talk about him because his gift is stronger than mine. So I don't want to tell anybody because I don't want them following him. See, it all goes back to nickels, numbers, and noses. Yeah. Because I'm not going to talk about him because, you know, his gift of healing is stronger than mine, and if people hear about him, they'll leave me and go partner with him and won't partner with me. See, we've got to get beyond that. That's not the love of God. The love of God says, yeah, amen, I'll pray for you. If you don't get healed, go to this guy. Amen? Let's, you know, throw, run, run them all past you. you know? I had one girl uh, tell me, I've had everybody pray for me. Everybody's prayed for me. And she named them. And I mean, she named some names. I'm like, wow, how did you get to them? <laughs> you know? <laughs> because you've been to all these people. And she goes, yep, hadn't seen a thing. Nothing's changed. And I'm like, and, and then she says, so what can you do for me? You know? And <laughs> I want to go, you know, I really want to say probably nothing with that attitude, you know, but I didn't, you know. And I, I said, so what I said was this. I said, you know what? I said, because I know how it works. I know that you can give what you got, and you keep putting it in them, and it's like they get filled up. Now, I know that's an analogy, okay? But I, what I told her was this. I said, look, here's what happened. You've been to all these guys. Each one has put in you what they had. You're probably this full. I said, all i got to do is lay hands on you and put a little bit more. I will probably put less in you than they did, but I'm going to push it over the top, and you're going to get healed. I said, why? Because now we're all working together, and they've given you, and now I'm going to give you, and we're just going to top it off and get you healed up. I didn't look at them and go, yeah, those guys got nothing. Don't worry about it. Yeah, they ain't got no power. I got power. Watch this. We'll get this done. No, why? Because we're all part of the body. They gave what they did, what they had. I'm going to give what I have. And if I don't give enough the first time, I'll give it again, and we'll keep giving it, we'll keep giving it until it gets done. Amen? Right. But I'm not going to blast somebody else because it didn't work whenever they did it. It did work. They just didn't get enough of it. And a lot of times that's because they were taught, well, I can't lay hands on you twice. Right? right? And if they had them, you'd have probably got healed. So we just got to start working around this and realize what counts is not my gift, your gift. What counts is that Jesus gets what he died for, which is them to be healed. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so let's look at this. He says here, I'm trying to hurry up, believe it or not. I'm, if I talk much faster, it's going to turn into tongues, right? <laughs> so, so, and if you all have the gift of interpretation, we can do that. That's fine. So, now, he says here, now watch this. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Yeah. Now, this is a principle. All of these things that you do, you do according to your proportion of faith. And as you do them, your faith grows. So, it's a principle. He says, or ministry. Now, the word ministry means service. So if you're going to serve, okay, let us wait on our, on our serving. In other words, when he says let us wait on it, he doesn't mean let's stand around with our hands folded. And turn. He, he says, let us, he's literally saying, let us do this with diligence and let us attend to serving. That's what that word literally means is let us attend, literally attend with diligence our serving. So if you're going to serve, do it well. How many of you have ever been to a restaurant and your server was not attentive? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're kind of like, hello, there they went, okay? They're not even looking. They walk by, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm eating bread and, you know, drinking a, was drinking a Coke, now the Coke's gone and I'm, <laughs> you know, like, please, come, bring me something, you know? <clears throat> and now guess what? They don't get as good a tip. Why? They weren't attendant. So if you're going to serve, serve well. Amen? Don't worry. Well, I'm above that. No, you ain't. Jesus wasn't above it. If he ain't above it, you ain't above it. Amen? Amen. So if you're going to serve, serve with attendance. Serve uh, attentively. Okay? Now, watch this. He says, or he that teaches on teaching. If you're going to teach, do it diligently. Do you get that? Study it out first. Don't just stand up. Well, I'm just going to say anything and just, I'm just going to, well, here's what I think it means. Nobody cares what you think. <laughs> right? That's what he says up here in the beginning. Let's, let's go back real quick. Now, notice this. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove. Why do you need your mind renewed? So you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's not three wills of God. There's one will of God, and it is good. It is perfect. It is acceptable. Do you get that? Right? Well, I'm not in God's perfect will, but I'm in his acceptable will. No, God is not schizophrenic. He doesn't have three wills. He has one will, and that one will is good, acceptable, and perfect. And he wants you to walk in his will. 
and he's made known his will to us, so you can't use that as an excuse. Well, I don't know the will of God. No, he said he's made known his will, right? And if you, I don't have time to go into it tonight, but maybe we can talk about it later while I'm here. But he says here, watch this, <clears throat> so that you can prove. Now, right there, he says, <clears throat> we were talking about if you're uh, on your teaching, do it with, with diligence, do it attentively, right? Don't just say anything. Why? And uh, this is what I always tell people. It says that we are to renew our minds so we can prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if your mind is not renewed, shut up. <laughs> Isn't that simple? Why? Because we are to be able to prove his will. And if, you don't, if your mind's not renewed, you can't prove his will. If you can't prove his will, you're not going to be saying his will. You're going to be saying something else. Amen. So shut up. Why? Because we don't want to know your opinion. We want to know the will of God. The Bible says very clearly, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Amen. I don't come in here and tell you, well, here's what I think about this. Now, you know, I've read five different commentaries, and none of them say the same thing. So I'm just going to tell you my opinion. No, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I don't have the right to my opinion. Right? I serve him. So I don't have a right to an opinion. I only, I'm an ambassador of Christ. I only have the right to tell you the policies of the kingdom I represent. I don't, I don't have the right to tell you what I think. Of. Well, what do you think about abortion? Well, here's what I think about abortion. Well, what do you think about immigration? Well, here's what I think about it. No, all I can tell you is what this word said. Why? Because I represent a king in a kingdom, and all I can say is what he has said. So if, now think about this, who is my king? Is he God? Yes. So if I speak to you and I speak like a man, you know right then I am not accurately representing Jesus. Why? Because if I'm going to accurately represent God, I have to talk like God, not like a man. Do you get that? You, do you understand that? So, in other words, if God is speaking and I'm saying what he's saying, then I'm going to be sounding like God is talking, not like a man talks. See, that's our problem. Too many times in church, you hear a person talking and all you're hearing is what a man would say. Yep. Well, this makes sense to me. This is what common sense would tell me, right? Well, common sense, number one, isn't all that common. <laughs> number two... Common sense comes from one of two sources of wisdom. There's two sources of wisdom, right? There's divine wisdom that comes down from above, and there's devilish wisdom, which is earthly and sensual or sense-oriented. Most preaching you hear comes from sense-oriented preaching. Well, this happened. I know the Bible says this, but this is what happened, so I have to look at the Bible according to my circumstances, and I'm going to interpret what the Bible says according to my circumstances. Now, what you just heard was, would be a good definition of devilish wisdom. And that's where sacred cows come from, traditions of men, which are nothing more than the doctrines of devils. Do you get that? I know this is strong and straightforward. It's the fact, if you're going to speak as an oracle of God, you're going to speak for God. You're going to say things that God would say, not things that man would say. And here's the thing. If you're going to speak for God and say what he would say, you're not going to make re room for excuses. Why? Because God don't make none. Amen? He expects, Jesus said, be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect, right? He said, well, yeah, but what if I mess up? Okay, he doesn't make room for it, but he says, if you do, here's what you do about it. Amen? He's not saying it's okay. He said, do something about it. Fix it, right? Now, let's keep going. <clears throat> Gifts differing. We don't want to, uh, we, we've talked about ministry and serving, and, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorts on exhortation. In other words, all these things you're supposed to be doing with diligence. You're supposed to be going after them to covet even these things, Right? Now watch, watch this one. This is, this is one I want to get to. <clears throat> or he that exhorts on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. You hear that? He that ruleth with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, don't go, okay, I'll let you go this time. No, if you're going to show mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Be glad to, to set them free. Be glad to give mercy, right? But now let's back up. <clears throat> if you're going to rule... Rule with diligence. What does that mean? And that's actually another word there for actually for even governing. 
okay? If you're going to govern. Now watch. Do you know, uh, and maybe you've heard this before, but in, in um, Isaiah, when it talks about it, it says, uh, to us a son is, is born, a child is born. Remember that? It, you hear it every Christmas. About the only time you ever hear it is on Christmas. <laughs> So I don't know if you remember it or not, but it's every Christmas you hear that, right? Now, it says, and upon his shoulders, or what, actually what it says, and the government yeah. shall be upon his shoulders. Yeah. It does not say the religion. Yeah. It says the government. Amen. That's why Jesus came preaching the kingdom and not a religion. Amen. Do you get that? Right. Now, we're called, what, a holy priesthood or a, 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 royal. A, a, a royal priesthood. And he says we're a holy nation. And you could take those two words and interchange them to say a holy priesthood and a royal nation. But he didn't say that. He said a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Why? Because we are supposed to be kings and priests. Amen. Amen? As a king, we rule, we dictate according to the policies of heaven. As a priest, what do we do? We execute judgment, justice, and mercy. We offer mercy. We bring forgiveness. We operate as a priest. But we have to operate as kings and priests. So it's twofold, right? We execute judgment, but we offer mercy. Are you with me? You're awful quiet. I hope you're thinking. Okay? Now, <clears throat> watch this. He says, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that giveth. Now, these are called the motivational gifts. So these are gifts that people operate out of. In other words, there are people that have a prophetic gifting, and that's their motivation is to speak prophetically, meaning to edify, exhort, and to uh, comfort. Isn't that right? You know people like that. Everywhere they go, that's what they do. They're just encouragers, okay? They're, that would be like Barnabas. That's what he was, son of consolation. He was always an encourager, right? And so you have people that are constantly encouraging people, exhorting people. You know, they just get around to everybody, you know, and, and they're talking to people. Yeah, you can do this. Oh, it's good to see you. Yeah, oh, you're looking great. Look at how you're doing. Yeah, that's good. You know, and, you know, Jesus just loves you. And, man, he's so proud of you. And you just, and they're just, that's how they are all the time. That's their motivation. That's how they function. Right. They think that way, right? right? That's, that's their motivation. And so it's the same thing. But now you notice these are motivational gifts. And he says here, giving is a motivational gift. And we've already done, we've already done the offering so you don't have to worry about it. I'm not taking up an offering, okay? But now, notice he said it's on giving, let him do it with simplicity. So there is a there are people that God has gifted with a gift of giving. That's their gift. They love to give. They and it could, and matter of fact, usually you'll find it in every area of their life. And sometimes, and the funny thing is, many times these people will be people of well, in the beginning, sometimes they're not people of stature and they're not people of wealth or any type of real finances. And because they're faithful in the little things, it, they keep growing. And then whenever they get to a point where their, to their needs are all you know, met and they're doing good and they're helping this thing, and now, now they're giving. These are people that we would call benefactors or people that are, are philanthropic and they want to, they, they're always looking for a cause to help give into. And usually they're wealthy. Why? Because that's their motivational gift. They make money and they don't even have to think about it. They just, and, but, it, but you go back and look at how they do it. And they, it's because they are following the, the laws of God. They're giving. And if they give, it'll be given back, pressed down, shaken together, running up. Isn't that right? So these things are operating. But there are people that have a gift of giving, and that's in them. So now, now think about this. If God, now this, is this in the Bible? Am I reading this out of the Bible? They have a gift of giving. If you're going to give, let it be with simplicity. Don't make a big show. Don't blow the trumpet. Don't make a big deal of it. Give it. Do it simply. Is that right? Is this Bible? So God puts in at least some people a gift of giving. Is that right? Now, how many of you know if you don't have anything, you can't give? Is that right? So if God puts in people in the church a motivational gift of giving, then he can't be against at least these people having that to give. Do you get that? Right. So God can't be for poverty. And you can find that all through the Bible. He's not. He calls it an oppression. He calls it, uh, you know, all these other things. It's bad. He calls it bondage, as a matter of fact. So if he's going to put in the body on a regular basis a gift of giving, that means that he also has to know that there has to be finances there available for that person to give or they're not going to be fulfilled in their gift that he gave them. Yeah. So God can't be against, at least these people here, prospering. 
Does that make sense? So, you know, and I can tell right now, there's going to be some of you going to go home tonight and go, oh, God, give me a gift of giving. Give me a gift, God. <laughs> no, here's how it works. When you see a gift you want, you start doing it, and then God increases it. Right? Why? Because you start with sowing and reaping. It's the same thing. See, when I, when I wanted the truth about healing, I started where I was at. I made mistakes, but I started searching, but I also started doing. And the more I sowed, the more knowledge and information started coming to me, the more revelation started coming to me. Why? Because God said, yeah, if I give this guy some information, he's going to use it, yeah. and he's going to share it. Yeah. Right? Now, think about that. What's the difference between me sharing what I've learned with God about how to get the sick healed and somebody sharing finances with people that need help? Yeah. What's the difference? It's all God. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. All I'm trying to say is that God is so much bigger than most people think. We were... Uh, me and Marty were talking today, and he said something. He said it twice now, and it stuck with me. And he was talking to some other people, and he said, you know, uh, we even have a name for it. We have Jehovah Jireh. That's a God, our provider. Right. And we know Philippians 4.19 that says that my God shall supply all your needs So because he's Jehovah Jireh, right? He's going to supply. He's going to supply. Now, but the amazing thing is this. God is not just Jehovah Jireh. He's also El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. Right. See, you could take him as your provider and never know him as a God who is more than enough. If you settle for him being your provider, you'll only have enough for you and your family or who's around you, which is actually selfish because it's, you know, Lord, us four, no more. As long as you take care of me, I'm good. No, that's not God. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is he's more than enough. See, the reason I minister healing the sick is because he's Jehovah Rapha El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough that wants to heal you, and he gives me enough healing for me to be well and for me to give it away to you too. Do you get that? Well, if he's also... El Shaddai in Jehovah Jireh, then he also is the God who is more than enough that can provide for you and even give you more than what you need. Why? So you can have to give to somebody else. Amen. Do you see how this works? All these names that he has, those are that's his character. And that's what uh, Marty was saying. You know, he's not the God of, of just enough. He's the God of more than enough. But see, we have this religious idea that if we have... Now, think about this. And it all comes from selfishness because we think, oh, I can't have... I couldn't have abundance. Why? Oh, you know, I, I'd probably fall into sin. Well, there's your problem right there. Deal with the sin. Deal with your heart, right? Why? Because God wants to use you to bless other people. And so, listen, if you, if you got rich tonight, you would not change. It's not going to change you. It's only going to give you the opportunity to reveal who you really are. It's not going to change you. See, money doesn't change people. It just reveals who they really are. If you're stingy and you got wealthy, you're going to be stingy wealthy. If you're generous and you got wealthy, you're going to be generous wealthy. But if you're generous, you're also going to be generous when you're poor. Isn't that right? Now, I know some of you get mad because I'm talking about money and stuff, but there's others in you that you need the help in this area. And you're thinking, yeah, tell me everything I can because I want to grow in this area because I'm tired of being broke and I want to help some people. That was my big thing. Man, it wasn't about the money. I, it wasn't about that. Right? that I wanted to help people. I hated it whenever they'd say, uh, we're trying to build this orphanage over in the Philippines and we need another $20,000. And I'm like, oh, I'll give you my 10, but I got to have gas to go home. I didn't want to live that way anymore. You know, I want to be, you know what? I, I want to be able to stand up and go, you know, bless God, everybody put your money away. I'm going to fund that orphanage. I'm going to do it. Why? Because God is more than enough. Amen? That's what we all should be thinking. It's not wrong to think. It's only wrong to be thinking, oh, God, dump it on me. Why? Give, oh, God, give me money. Why? So that I can, you know, heap it upon my own lust. No, he said that's why you won't get it. Right? Why? Because you asked and you don't get. It's because you asked to miss because you asked to put it upon your own lust. So that's the whole point. And people say, well, well if, I, you know, if I had a million dollars, I would give, you know, 10% of that to church. You're lying. You ain't giving 10% to church now. <laughs> if you ain't giving 10% now, you, ain't, you sure ain't going to do it then. If, if you think $10 out of 100 is a big bill, whenever you look at that $10 million that you somehow come in contact and you're going to give a million away, that million dollar bill is a lot bigger than a $10 bill, right? And you're going to hang on to it a whole lot more. I mean, it's, they're going to have to rip that thing out of your hand, right? Why? Because that's who you are. So let's keep going. He says, yeah, I'm going to have to hurry. That says low battery, but I'm, I, I don't have a low battery, so I'm good. So we can keep on going. So, now, he says, he that ruleth with diligence, he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, I want to take you very quickly 
to another place. I know that was, I said that a while ago when I said going to Romans 12, and we're taking my whole time there. So we'll see how far I can get on this, right? Actually, you know what? Go with me to Romans 8. We'll go two places here. Romans 8, and then we'll finish up. Romans 8, and we're going to look at verse 4. It says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You get that? So what does that tell you? That the righteousness of the law can be fulfilled in you. You get that? See, people love that. You know, you hear like, like the lady that said, oh, you know, I love the doctrines of the church. Really, which one do you like the most? Well, oh, I love that one about falling from grace, and I practice it every day. <laughs> no, that's not the one you want to practice, right? <laughs> but it's funny because we look at that and we think, well, you know, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and people want to live in that. It's like, okay, all have fallen short. It doesn't say that now that all are falling short. Fallen is past tense. You were fallen, and he picked you up. Right. Now you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're not the ones falling below the glory of God. Now the glory of God is upon you. Now the glory of God lives in you. Amen. Now we are the glory of God. His glory lives within us. And he said, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Yeah. What did they see? Did they see a cloud? No. You know what they saw? They saw a dead man come out of a tomb. Yeah. The power of God demonstrated is the glory of God. Right. See, we want this thing. We want a cloud. We want to talk, oh, the cloud came in and the gold dust came down and, oh, it was amazing. And we had all this gold dust and it had oil come out of our hands. That doesn't bring glory to God. What that does is you use it as an advertisement to try to launch a revival, which means more people, which means a bigger bank account for the church. Now, can I be honest with you? Right? Because that's what I'm doing no matter whether you like it or not. Right? <laughs> But bottom line, that's what it comes down to. The glory. You know, the Bible says that man, okay, man is the glory of God. Yeah. That's what it says. Yeah. And he says even now, and he has crowned you in Psalm 8. He says he has crowned you with glory and honor. Yeah. He's crowned you with glory. You get that? Yeah. And so here, there's all kinds of verses in the Bible that talk about the glory of God and one of those glories is man. You are the glory of God. God looks at you and goes, look what I did. Yep. Look what I made. Yep. Look what I created. And he's not talking about your outward person. Right. He did that in Adam. Yep. He's talking about your inward person who he recreated. He said, man, look how messed up they were. And now look at them. Look at that. They look just like my son Jesus inside. Yeah. Now if I can ever get what's in them out. Yeah. Right? And that's our problem. We, let, we keep Jesus trapped. Right? We keep him hung up in there, and he can't get out. But if we start letting him out, now the way you let him out is you let him out of your spirit and into your soul, but the only way he can function through your soul is have your soul renewed, your mind renewed to the Word of God. Yeah. So he has to come out of your spirit and get into your soul, but to the degree your, soul, your mind is renewed, to that degree the glory and the Spirit of God is able to be released. Amen. So the less your mind is renewed, the less of the Spirit of God can flow out of you unless he functions through a gift where he bypasses your mind and just functions directly. And that's where most people get it. That's where most people live. And they're satisfied with that because they don't want to renew their mind because it's an effort to renew your mind. Right. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes diligence. Right? So we just go, oh, just give me a gift. That way I don't have to do anything and just use me with a gift. And that was never his intention. The gift was there to meet the need you had before you knew how to meet that gift through the fullness of the Spirit. The gift was there to help you. You get that? It, you were never meant to operate in the fullness of the gifts or in the gifts on a regular basis. You were meant to operate in the fullness of the Spirit like Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Now, the result of you operating in the fullness of the Spirit will be the same result of you operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Same result, different means. And the beauty of that is the same result will be even better because it will be consistent. Whereas gifts generally aren't that consistent right. in people's lives. God could be consistent, but most people are not. right? And so you don't stay in a place where God can use you with that gift. And that's what most of the church 
focus is on is how to keep you there. And as Thomas said today, that mostly comes through worship, where they're trying to get you in that place. Yeah. And that's why sometimes there are a lot of people that come in and you have to preach or you have to actually come in first off and you'll have to have, you know, an hour and a half of worship. Why? Right. Not because the glory of God's there, but because the, the worship team is trying to get all the garbage off of you you picked up during the day. Right. And they're trying to get you clear through to God so that you can function in that and they have to sense what, where the Spirit of God is in you and know when, how far they have to go to get all that stuff shook off of you so that you're focusing on God and not thinking about, well, did I turn the stove off at home? <laughs> Let me think, did I turn it off or I leave it on? Oh, we may have to leave early, I, I can't remember. And you're saying, well, I got that report in the morning that my wife, I don't get that report in. And the whole time they're up here singing and worshiping God and trying to pull you into the worship and you're sitting there and they have to keep going until they can see that God has actually got you to that place where God can actually, you can hear from God and God can speak to you. Amen? Amen? Okay, don't shout me down just because I'm preaching good. Mm. <laughs> Oh, that water's good. It's almost as good as Coke. Anyway, so, <laughs> no. <clears throat> so he says here <clears throat> that the righteousness of the, of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now, I really want to get into this next section, but we, there's no way I have time. So we will pick this up uh, in the morning because I, I want to get this across here. I'm telling you, this is, man, if you get this, I guarantee it's going to, it's, it's going to, this, tomorrow's session's, I promise you, if you will listen to it and put it in practice, it will absolutely change your life. I promise you that, right? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to walk in the blessings that God has already given you and how to cause them to function what they are and how to function in them. Amen? Amen. So, uh, you know what? We're just going to go ahead and pray. Yeah, because if, if I start this next section, session, um, we'll be here to midnight. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. Father, we just thank you that you are, have been so good and gracious to us that you would give us this word. That by this word, we can know about you and know how to make contact with you so that we can get to know you. And Father, we thank you that your word is absolutely true. That we, we not only can we, but we do stake our very eternity on this word. And we thank you. We thank you for what you have given us. We thank you for what you are giving us, what you're working in us and through us. And Father, we know that we may not be fully where we need to be yet, but we know in the Spirit we are exactly who you made us to be. Yes. And we thank you that you know, I may not be what I'm going to be, but I'm definitely better than I was. And every day is better and better. And we keep growing forward. We keep moving forward in you. And Father, I thank you even now that by your Spirit, you minister to those that are here. You take this word that I've spoken tonight, and because I believe it came by your spirit, that I know that the spirit can take it, use it, put it forth in their lives, cause it to get literally anchored into their souls because it's already in their spirit, and that they will walk it out and that they will have their minds renewed so that they can prove your will. And that, Father, that they will be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their mind. That they will be already conformed to the image of your son, walking, talking, acting like him in every area, loving you, loving people, in Jesus' name, right now, so be it, amen, 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 all right, now, in you, before we leave, before we get up, now, in you right now, I'm just going to take just a second to do this, <clears throat> but if you are born again, the Spirit of God abides in you. If he is in you, he is in your spirit, you've been recreated, you're a new creation, old things are passed away, all things have become new, all things are of God, that's who's in you. You got that? Now, if you, if, if okay, now think about this. I'm known around the world for healing. I don't care what I teach on, if I took questions, it'd be about healing. Somebody would ask about healing. Most everybody would. Now think about this. I live in divine health. Have I ever been sick? Yeah. And I beat it, you know, and, and it was years ago, actually. And ma matter of fact, if you ask my children, they'll tell you they don't ever remember seeing me sick, right? Why? Because they, they grew up in this. Now, the amazing thing about this is this. Think about this. I'm known for healing. I know the truth about healing. I've seen if probably hundreds 
of thousands of people healed now under, under my own hands, right? The people I had laid hands on. If I got sick, where would I go? Who am I going to go to? You, know, you see what I mean? See, generally, if you're not known for healing, maybe there's somebody you would try to get to. Maybe me or somebody else, right? Because they're the best person known for you, you try to get to them. You have that option. I don't have that option. There's nobody for me to go to, right? So what does that mean? That means I had to learn how to receive healing for myself, yeah. right? And so I had to look at it and say, okay, how do I do? What am I doing when I lay hands on the sick? Well, I'm releasing God's life, his spirit, out of my spirit where he abides through my flesh, so to speak. By my faith, I'm directing it, and it goes into them. Now, when it goes into them, the Spirit of God goes into the person because it's the Spirit of God that heals. The Spirit, of the, God that, the Spirit of God that heals goes into their spirit. It does not go into their flesh. You get it? Because what's born of spirit is spirit. What's born of flesh is flesh. So His Spirit does not go into the flesh and heal the flesh. Now, it's the flesh that needs healing. It's not their spirit. Their spirit's okay. Yeah. You know, if they're born again, especially. So I lay hands. His spirit leaves my spirit, so to speak, goes into their spirit, then out of their spirit goes out into their flesh, just like pouring water on the roots of a plant. You don't pour water on the leaves. It does no good. You pour it on the roots. It's soaked up, goes in, up through the stalk of it, and then goes out from the inside, and the plant receives nourishment from the inside. It's, that's exactly how healing works. When I lay hands on the sick, the Spirit of God goes out and into their spirit, into their spirit, up in and out through their flesh, and wherever the sickness is, it comes out of their spirit and drives the sickness out of their flesh and replaces it with life. That's how healing works. All right? Now, I had to learn how to release the spirit. Out, if I needed healing... I had to learn how to release it out of my spirit into my own flesh. Now, I was very good at releasing it out of my spirit and into somebody else's spirit because that's what I did. So I had to kind of reverse engineer that and go, okay, how does that work? So then I said, okay, so what I'm now in the beginning, I did exactly what I do for them. I would lay my hands on whatever part was sick or hurt or whatever it was. And then I realized it doesn't really matter because spirit covers everything. And so then at one point I said, okay, so I'm just going to make this a closed circuit, right? And I'm just going to put my hands together and ask a closed, it stays here. It doesn't go anywhere. It stays right. I know that's silly, but it was just a way that I could visualize it. And so then I started saying, okay, then I realized that when I lay hands on it, I am directing the Spirit of God by my faith. The Spirit follows my faith. My faith is my intention. What do I intend to happen? I intend the spirit to heal their body, whatever sick. So I just said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose by faith to release my, the spirit of God out of my spirit and into my flesh. And my intention is that pain, that illness, whatever it is, to be healed. So the intention, my faith went to that place, took the spirit with it, and the intention was to be healed, and that's what I got because that's what I believed for. Amen. And when I did that, the thing left, right? And I can tell you uh, many, many, many times this happened over 40 years, right? And so I've learned how to do that. So for you, the real key, listen, it is not God's will that if you get sick that you have to find somebody to get healed. That is not God's will. Now, he, he made provision for it because he knows there's levels of growth. That's why he said in James, if any, there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders, and they'll come, and they'll anoint them with oil, pray over them in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So he made provision for it, right? But as you grow, you have to realize you're the one delivering the power to the people. So you've got to learn for yourself and not run to somebody else, but get it for yourself because we're supposed to be first partakers of whatever it is we're preaching or doing, yeah. right? And so it's not a matter of, well, I'm going to take him to brother so-and-so and let brother so-and-so. No, we're supposed to give it to him. And I mean, obviously we're like Peter. Lord, send the people away. They're hungry. You know, you got to feed the, these people got to go eat. What did Jesus say? You feed them. 
He didn't say, yeah, send them in, send them to somebody else. He said, you feed them. And they're like, are you kidding me? We, we ain't got enough for this. He said, what have you got? And they said, we got a couple little things here. He said, bring it to me. And he blessed it, and he gave it to them. And when they passed it out, it multiplied. It didn't multiply in Jesus' hands. It multiplied in the hands of the disciples. That's exactly what he wants to happen with us. Amen? He wants you to be able to receive healing. Because that's what he said in Romans chapter 8. He even tells you that if the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you, then he will quicken, make alive, heal your mortal bodies by that same spirit that, ra that dwells in you, is what he says. So he wants to heal you by the spirit that dwells in you. Because when I lay hands on you, all I'm doing is kind of packing in more of the same spirit you got. And I pack in enough to drive out the sickness. It's just like taking a bottle that has muddy water in it, taking the lid off, putting it under a water faucet, and turn it on, and you just keep flowing water in. In a few minutes, guess what? It's going to be all clear water in there. Why? Because you just flushed it out with the clean water. That's all I do. When I lay hands on you, I'm just flushing out the garbage by putting in the clean water of the Spirit into your bottle, into your spirit, and it goes out and drives out the garbage. That's all I'm doing. Right? See, that's what you can do, and you can do it for yourself. You don't need my hands. See? Now, see, if I was trying to create job security, I would tell you, you need my hands. But I'm not trying to create job security. I'm trying to do my job and help you grow up to look like Jesus. Who did Jesus ever go to to say, here, I'm not feeling good. Would you lay hands on me right here? Can you picture Jesus doing that? Of course not. Why not? But you're supposed to be just like him. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. Amen? Amen? So all you have to do is, I'm going to tell you, just this side, right now, if you're sick in your body, something going on, here's what you do. I'm going to show you how to do it. You just this side right now. The Spirit of God dwells in your spirit, in your belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay? But He dwells there, and you just this side, by faith, right now, I am releasing His Spirit into every cell in my body. And any cell, any organ that is sick, any sickness in my body right now, that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead drives out that sickness or disease out of my body. And you just take a second and let it do it. And you choose to decide to believe. And when you do, what you believe is what is going to happen. If you believe total healing, you're going to get totally healed. If you believe partial healing, you're going to get partially better. If you believe, well, it'll probably start now and end three days from now, then you're going to get a progressive healing. Why? Because you get what you believe. It's a law. There's no way around it. Right? Well, no, you don't understand. I know I'm believing. I'm sorry, but I'm going to trust Jesus, not you. Right? You think you're believing, but if you're not well, you're not believing. It's just that simple. I'm not putting you down. Just saying, decide to believe the Word of God. It's a choice. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's do Y'all want to do that real quick? Yeah. Two minutes. I mean, it doesn't even take that long, right? Just right now. Just close your eyes. Get everything else out of your mind. Don't even think about stuff, right? And just decide right now. Decide if there's sickness in your body, if there's something. Doesn't matter what it is or where it is. Just right now, just decide. Out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. And it's going to flow out of my spirit and into my flesh. And right now, as it goes out, it drives out. It's going right to where it needs to go. It goes to the, to the sickness. It goes to the dry ground, so to speak. And this water of the Spirit of God goes to that place and drives it out. And right now, I release the Spirit of God into my flesh in Jesus' name. And by His stripes, I am healed. And just let it work. Just let it go. Just relax. Don't tense up. Just relax. Let him work. He's doing it. You're not doing it. You're just believing. He's doing the work. And his life is flowing into your flesh. And how do you know that? Because all I'm doing is preaching the word to you. And his words are life and health to all their flesh, he says. His spirit, his words. 
His words are spirit and they are life and they are health to your flesh. That spirit that is in you is life and health to your flesh. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.